Mr. Kuto, thanks for the opportunity. Oh, thank you. So I want to first start by asking you about the last uh, provincial election. Uh, liberals uh, are now reduced, the Liberal caucus in the legislature is now reduced to six MPPs. Five. Five. Oh, yeah. there was actually one resignation. Right, right, right. right. Uh, so who do you actually blame? What happened in the last election? Who do you blame for this loss? Well, I think, you know, this is one of the, the big questions people ask when they say, what happened uh, back in June of 2018? And uh, there are so many different reasons, I think, why uh, the Ontario Liberal Party came to this, uh, this point. Uh, one of the main reasons uh, is 15 years in government is a long time. Uh, at that point, I think the Ontario Liberal Party is the longest serving government in all of Canada. Uh, so that's a, uh, it's, you know, it's a long time to be in politics uh, and to, to be in government. In addition to that, there was a series of decisions over the course of the last several years from the gas plans to the selling of hydro um, issues, policy issues um, that people disagreed with. So it was a buildup. It wasn't one specific thing, but a buildup of many things that got us to the point. You have to remember in politics, every time you make a decision, you may, the majority of Ontarians may agree, but there's also a, a portion, it could be 10%, 20% that disagree. And eventually you get to a point where that builds up. And I thought, I think what uh, Doug Ford uh, was able to accomplish was uh, he inherited a coalition of opposition uh, that built up over a long period of time and uh, people were just done with the, uh, the Ontario Liberal Party. Uh, the Ford government now has been in power for almost a year and a half. Right. Uh, they uh, made promises during the campaign uh, that they're going to bring fiscal responsibility to the province. And uh, now in the budget that they uh, submitted, uh, there was many budget cuts and service cuts. Uh, but when they saw the negative reaction, they backtracked on some of those cuts. Uh, right. Yesterday, they actually offered an update uh, to the budget, which demonstrated that they're uh, reversing some of those decisions. Right. So what's going on in the legislature? How do you assess uh, the performance of Doug Ford's uh, government? You know, there's a misconception out there that conservatives are great managers of, of uh, the Canadian economy. You know, uh, people don't realize that Stephen Harper uh, ran a massive deficit, the, the, the largest deficit in the history of this country. Um, in the last uh, 40 years, I believe the budget's only been balanced seven times in Ontario, and five of those were through liberal governments and two uh, during a conservative time period. So. Um, the belief that conservatives are these uh, great managers is, is not necessarily uh, true when you start to look at uh, the numbers. Uh, yesterday, Doug Ford and the Conservatives uh, presented a, a fall economic statement, which is really just a, an economic output and a fiscal plan that's presented back to Ontarians. And we're finding that Doug Ford uh, is spending more than the Liberals ever spent, um, and we're just getting way less. We see crisis in, in public education, in health care. We see that uh, libraries still have massive cuts, legal aid. Um, we see that uh, breakfast programs, nutrition programs for students, after school programs, all of these, uh, these elements have been cut. Uh, Doug Ford believes he can actually make massive cuts and then give back a little bit of money and actually say that they're actually contributing more. But if I take $2 from you and give you back 50 cents, uh, I shouldn't feel good based on the fact that I've given you 50 cents. You should be asking me for my two dollars, your two dollars back. And that's exactly what the conservative government's done. So it's an old uh, strategy they use and it was apparent yesterday that we are uh, spending more than the Liberals ever did and we are just getting less as, as people in Ontario. Um, about the cuts to the autism program, right? Uh, I know that specifically you were concerned about the cuts that happened. Now, yesterday that was one of the uh, parts, yeah. one of the programs that they reversed their decision, the earlier decision that they made to uh, make cuts to the program right. and to the services that are offered. Um, are you happy with what they uh, are doing right now? That they, uh, are they completely reversing the decision on that? Well, we took the uh, the budget from about one hundred and sixty thousand, one hundred and sixty million dollars to three hundred and twenty one million dollars with the autism file. Uh, they're saying now that they're doubling it to six hundred. Um, what I would, what I'm going to be very curious to see, 
is what that money is actually going to be used for because the money that we had allocated uh, was strictly for something called ABA uh, therapy. It's um, behavioral therapy. Uh, we're not sure if Doug Ford's uh, 600 million includes everything spent, uh, that we spend on autism services from sp speech and language to uh, services in schools and therapy. So uh, the, uh, the details will reveal uh, the, uh, the approach that they're going to take. So I am happy that they've uh, committed to restoring funding. I am happy that, uh, that, they, uh, that they see this as a priority. Uh, but the details will reveal exactly where they're going. Mr. Kuto, you're running for the leadership of the Ontario Liberal Party. Um, if you get elected as the leader of the party, as a new leader, uh, what are your plans? How are you planning to make changes to the party and kind of take it back to the position that it had before the election? Yeah, that's a, it's a really good question. I don't think there's um, any going back. What we're trying to do here is to build a new party, a, a new Liberal Party uh, that is uh, built on the aspirations of Ontarians where people can come in and contribute to um, the ideas and they feel that they have an invested uh, stake uh, as stakeholders within that party. Uh, we want to uh, focus, we know what the big issues are in Ontario. It's climate change, the new economy, education and healthcare. But we can't accomplish any of that without really approaching it uh, with some foundational pieces. We need to uh, be honest about um, where we've come from. We need to incorporate people into uh, the development of ideas. It needs to be on, built on a foundation where uh, uh, there's some strong uh, values. And we need to understand what it means to be a liberal today. Uh, back in 1968-1970, Pierre Elliott Trudeau uh, brought forward the concept of multiculturalism, bilingualism, uh, the just society. These were big elements, big ideas to bring people together, to build social cohesion. Uh, we need to look for ways for people to be part, to feel as though that they're part of something and to realize if they work hard that there will be opportunity there to build. And we're finding more and more Ontarians today not being able to actually believe that if they work hard, they're going to get ahead. And I think those liberal values need to be reevaluated. We need to build a party that's prepared to take on the challenges of the future. And it has to be built in a way where we can redefine what it means to be a liberal today. And I believe that is the belief that we are better when we actually stick together, work together, defend each other's rights and uh, look for ways to create and share opportunity. Uh, you mentioned that you recently published a plan uh, that you made some commitments uh, for building a responsive and ethical government. Right. Um, why did you publish this plan? Why are you making these commitments? Why do you think Ontario needs this plan now? I think a lot of people were uh, disconnected from the Ontario Liberal Party. They didn't feel like um, the party was representing their needs, uh, their interests. And I think that we need to uh, recommit to the people of Ontario with some very bold ideas about how we get more people to be uh, included in the party and how we build a foundation that's built on some strong uh, values. Um, one of the concepts I bring up is uh, lowering the vo voter age to 16. The reason I did that is because um, I believe the time's come to bring young people into, that, into the debate. Uh, you know, if you're a young person in Ontario, you can you drive a car down the 401, uh, you know, you can, you can actually join the military with your parents' permission and I believe serve at 17. You can get married with your family's per permission, which, um, you know, I wouldn't advocate, but, you know, you can actually go, go ahead and do that. I think the time's come to actually have young people, 16 and over, to be part of this process uh, so, uh, so that they can contribute to the, the growth of this, uh, this beautiful province. Um, I always say that uh, if every 14-year-old, because to, to vote in a nomination for leader within the party, you only have to be 14. So 14-year-olds can come, show up, and pick the party leader, but they can't vote in the election for that person. So, you know, I want to, uh, I want to uh, create a, uh, a bit of an opportunity for young people to, to voice their concern, not only at the nomination, but in the general election. Uh, so that's why I'm doing it, and I, I believe that it's, uh, the time has come. And just as a factual point, you know, in Canada at one stage, it, you had to be 21 to vote. But there came a time where there was a debate, and they lowered it to 18. I think that debate uh, among liberals and Ontarians is so necessary 
and we can actually build a better province by having people participate at an earlier age. Um, one of the major problems that uh, immigrants, new immigrants, uh, face in Ontario is entering the job market. Now, among them, especially foreign trained professionals, uh, face many barriers uh, for entering the job market, uh, acc getting accreditation for their degrees, and then finding the right job uh, for, for their profession. Um, what do you think is the problem, especially you have experience in the immigration right. uh, file? And uh, you were the immigration, uh, you were the minister for immigration and citizenship in Ontario. Right. Uh, so, what are the problems uh, that that uh, we have today? Why those problems exist, and what do you think is a solution? So, I was the minister of citizenship and immigration uh, for almost uh, just a year and a bit, I believe it was, and um, this was one of the biggest issues that came up. This was in two thousand thirteen. Um, we have, and I remember the numbers back then, only 7% of doctors who are foreign trained come to Ontario and actually get to practice. To me, that's completely unacceptable. And um, I've been going around uh, in Ontario uh, talking about how Ontario is losing so much opportunity. Every single day, we see opportunity lost. Uh, you know, if it's a farmer who can't connect to the internet, uh, and can't use that technology to, to help har harvest their crop or a young indigenous woman in northern Ontario who can't go to university because she can't get the academic stream where she lives or you know even a young person in a community in, in Toronto that you know can't get uh, the opportunity to go to post-secondary because they can't afford it. It's the same thing with a doctor who's being foreign trained with all this knowledge and expertise who ends up, you know, we hear the story all the time, driving a taxi or, you know, working at doing x-rays or something like that. What a waste of human capital. I think there's been too much of that in Ontario. And it's time for us to challenge the authorities that, 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 that have the ability to make those changes uh, to actually uh, to step up and to, and to accelerate those credentials uh, much faster than what's taking place. And... In addition to that, I've seen some good examples, like the engineers, for example, they do a fantastic job. If you're an engineer and you come from a different country, they have this, these international bodies that work together to, to pull people you know, together and, and, and accelerate uh, accreditation in other jurisdictions. We need to learn from the organizations that are doing really good jobs, and we have to demand as citizens that the, uh, the bodies like the College of Doctors who control uh, the flow of, uh, of those accreditations and other organizations that are similar, that they work with government to look for ways to, uh, to accelerate that process. And we need to set some standards and, and benchmarks because 7% to me, if that number is still correct, and those, that's old data, to me is completely unacceptable. Um, so th this is a big issue for the Iranian Canadian community right. and there are viewers. Um, do you commit that both as, as a member of provincial parliament and also if you get elected as a leader, leader of the Ontario Liberal Party, that this will be a priority on your, on your table? This, I will commit 100% that this will be a priority because every single opportunity in this province that we're missing will be a priority for me. We have too many opportunity leaks in this province and it's time to plug those holes and to me when we have a doctor who's you know I met a doctor who uh, was a um, plastic surgeon um, uh, and we you know he showed me his work the pictures were sometimes uh, a bit hard to handle but I mean you know reconstructive surgery and this like this person was incredible one of the the top doctors in their jurisdiction from where they came from and this person was doing uh, medical work, you know, for the last 20 years at like a clinic, like, you know, and I used the x-ray, doing x-rays and things like that. You know, what a waste of talent. You know, what a waste of someone who's gone to school and spent so much time and energy to get to that point, comes to a place like Ontario and can't find that opening, you know, to, to get, you know, maybe some, a bit of training and uh, maybe there's a, there's some vocabulary that's different, maybe some standardizations or methods that are different, but we have to get these folks back into those places where they're, they're good, uh, where, you know, that's, uh, that's connected to their profession and, uh, and really leverage that potential in Ontario. To me, the waste of human capital is the single most important issue uh, in Ontario and we cannot allow 
that to continue to happen? In the final days uh, before the last federal election in October, uh, you endorsed the Iranian Canadian MP Majid Johari. Right. Um, you also mentioned in your endorsement that uh, you've had some experience working with him, uh, specifically on issues related to mental health. Right. Um, I wanted to ask you about that. Why did you endorse him, and what has been your experience working with? Him? So I um, went to an event one day, and this is a few years ago, and it was an event. Uh, uh, supporting a uh, youth mental health and I was the minister responsible for mental health uh, during that time period so for Ontario and this man spoke and I didn't know him and uh, he was very passionate he talked about mental health being a priority for him and uh, I really listened to him and I was inspired with what he had to say and his advocacy then I found out he was the member of parliament uh, for Richmond Hill so we uh, connected and we spoke a few times he came all the way to my office and sat down and we, we spoke. He was at the legislature. And I was really impressed with his passion and the fact that, you know, when you're a member of parliament, you can pick any subject to focus on. But for someone to, to pick that issue um, and dedicate their work and their time at the, at the House of Commons on that issue was very impressive. And he was one of the few federal MPs that actually showed up to my office to speak to me about those types of Ontario-based issues. So. Uh, when we spoke uh, during the election, um, I asked, I said, is there anything I can do to help you? He said, I'd love your endorsement. I said, absolutely. I'm always going to endorse and support people who make contributions, especially to help young people in Ontario. And I was very proud to do that. Mm -hmm. Great. And um, if our viewers want to support your leadership campaign, right. tell us how they can do that. So you can go to michaelcoto.com. Uh, it's uh, www. M I C H A E L C O T E A U dot com, and you can uh, you can connect that way, or you know send me a message on Twitter. Uh, my Twitter handles at Koto at C O T E A U. Uh, you know you can find me. I'm uh, you just search Michael Koto, and uh, you'll find me. You'll find the campaign. Uh, get involved. But the number one thing you can do is to sign up to be an Ontario Liberal before December second. Um, you can go online to uh, the Ontario Liberal website to do that. Uh, people can uh, make a financial uh, donation to the campaign. This is a very expensive exercise that, um, uh, that we're going through and uh, any contribution would be great. And, um, and uh, just get involved, connect with us and come out to an event and uh, meet many other Liberals that are, are, have joined me on this pursuit to, uh, to change the way we do politics in Ontario to restore decency back into politics and to really put in place a plan that will position Ontario for success in the future by capturing that opportunity like human capital and leveraging that human capital to focus on climate change, the economy, healthcare, education. And I want to, at the end of the day, make sure that Ontario is the best possible place to raise a child, where they feel the safest, where they have the access to the best education, where they feel uh, uh, the most protected, they're the healthiest, and we build our dreams based on their dreams. And if we can do that, Ontario will be good for everyone. Um, and the leadership convention is in March 2020, am I right? Correct. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much, Mr. Koto, for Thank the Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thank you.